This is a story about a French explorer whose name was La Perouse and the place of an ancient glacier known as Latouya Bay. In July 1958, the Fairweather Fault shifted and a mountain of rock and ice fell into the narrow bay and caused a tsunami more than 1,700 feet high. Imagine facing a wave taller than the Empire State Building. No greater wave exists in recorded history. Mr. G. T. Emmons described Latouille Bay as the bed of a great glacier long since taken possession of by the sea that floods and ebbs through its restricted entrance with a force that makes it the most justly dreaded harbor on the Pacific coast. It seems little is still spoken of the French naval officer, La Perouse. He was an accomplished navigator. He was the commanding officer who prevailed against the British Hudson Bay settlement during the American Revolution. In 1783, La Perouse became the commanding officer of the sailing ships Boussole and the Astrolabe, the Compass and Sextant. Then in June 1786, La Perouse sailed the Gulf of Alaska southwest following the continental shelf in sight of the Fairweather Range. He had no navigational aids or charts that warned of rock ledges, sandbars, or contrary currents concealed by the sea. The Princeton Hall, built by native students in Sitka, Alaska, she was designed as a missionary boat for travel to Clinkett villages situated along the inside passage. She was launched only days before the bombs fell on Pearl Harbor. Conscripted immediately by the United States Navy, she patrolled Alaskan waters with a cannon mounted on her bow and depth charges to her stern. July 2010, privately owned now, the Princeton Hall was provisioned to sail from Juneau north to the outside waters of the Gulf and into the infamous Latouille Bay. It was a journey more than two years in the planning. All parties aboard were focused on the dangers of the passage into the bay. The tsunami of July 1958 and the tragic history of the French explorer La Perouse, whose story grew even more significant after our passage through the perilous entrance at high tide in perfect weather conditions on the very day we hoped they would present. I only see the front range still. It is that arch.
I don't have the rear range. The rear range is now coming up. I have both ranges, rear ranges um, in the shadow. That's that little notch over in there on the. Yeah. Okay. I'll need your elbow back. To the no, I don't see the I don't see the rear yet, so I only see the front. Look at this popple. Look at this wave. This is really quite something. On range. Very good indeed. Perfect. Time across the bar. Nineteen thirty-eight. Got it. Well, the Tuya Bay, ladies and gentlemen. Yes. Well done, fellas. Very well done. Well done. June now, 1786. La Bruce sends a crew to explore the narrow opening from the Gulf into Latuya Bay. They returned with a favorable report. Encouraged by their observations, his first attempt to gain passage into Latuya Bay would fail. Reluctantly, he tried a second time and successfully passed into the bay. He anchored the Busol and the Ostrolab behind the island that soon he would name Cenotaph, the empty tomb. His ship scholars study the region noting animals and their behaviors, plant species and varieties, and the culture of the Clinket inhabitants who lived and traded in the region. La Perouse notes, the natives' considerable dread of the passage, and that they never venture to approach it unless at the slack water of flood or ebb. La Perouse waits now for conditions to sail back out of Latuya Bay. July 13, 10 minutes before 6 a.m., he sends three longboats to sound the bay and the passage. La Perouse expressly charges that the boats are not to be exposed to the least danger and not to approach the passage if there were the least appearance of breakers or even swells. Excerpts, ship's log, the narrative of Monsieur Boutin. I perceived the passage covered with breakers from one side to the other and that it was impossible for us to approach it. Monsieur de Skure was then ahead, lying on his oars, apparently waiting for me. But when I was within musket shot of him, he rode on. This he several times repeated. In an instant, I was in the midst of the heaviest waves, which almost filled the boat and yet she did not go down and still answered the helm. At one of those moments when I was at the top of a wave, I saw her on her broadside 60 or 80 yards ahead, but could perceive neither men nor oars. After having bailed the boat, I thought of assisting my unfortunate comrades, but my hopes were at an end. 
Two of these launches will capsize, killing 21 of the expedition's officers and crew. La Perouse would write, Nothing remained for us but to quit with speed a country that had proved so fatal. We still owed a few days to the families of our unhappy friends. If to the contrary, to all probability, any one had been able to return. Then contrary winds detained us longer than I intended so that we could not sail till the 30th of July, 18 days after the event which it has given me so much pain to remember and the remembrance of which will ever render me Unhappy. La Perouse erected a monument on the island in the middle of Latouille Bay that he named Cenotaph, the empty tomb, at the foot of which a bottle was buried, inscribed at the entrance of this harbor perished 21 brave seamen. Reader, whoever thou art, mingle thy tears with ashes.